So Pattern Ag is a unique organization that helps analyze where the crop journey begins, and that's really with the soil. Pattern Ag detects the most damaging pests and pathogens by measuring the biology of the soil to predict what will happen agronomically in the field. Pattern Ag uses this data to predict the biggest threats to your operation with 90% confidence before the season starts. This accuracy and advanced timing unlocks farm profitability by enabling precise product placement for your key agronomic inputs, and we're really looking forward to this session here today. Here with us from Pattern Ag, we've got two different speakers. Mike Tweedy is our first. Mike is the Vice President of Sales at Pattern Ag. Mike was raised on a multi-generational farm in Southern Illinois, founded in the late 1700s. He earned his bachelor's and master's degrees in agronomy from Southern Illinois University. Over the expanse of his career, he's worked for multinational ag companies in various executive roles. And in 2010, he shifted his career focus to small and large startups, most recently in the ag tech sector. Mike serves as the Vice President of Sales at Pattern Ag and leads the Midwest Commercial Team. Mike and his family currently reside in the Atlanta, Georgia area, so we're going to welcome Mike for being here with us today. Our other speaker that you'll see on the line is Danielle Watts, and Danielle is the Vice President of Data Science at Pattern Ag. With her expertise in building product-focused teams that integrate field research into machine learning models and the data pipelines that surround them, at Pattern Ag, Danielle leads the team developing, optimizing, and validating soil metagenomic insights in agricultural settings across the Midwestern U.S. Her team focuses on the scalability of bioinformatics and the proven ROI of insights for growers. Danielle was previously the Vice President of Data Science at Arable Labs, leading a team covering the device to customer ecosystem, climate model downscaling, device calibration, and agronomic modeling. Danielle holds a PhD in interdisciplinary ecology from the University of Florida. So I hope you're all very excited about this session. I think this is gonna be a great one to learn more about what Pattern Ag does and how we can connect with Climate Field View and really excited for the team here to present to you here today. So with that, Mike, I will pass it over to you to get started. And as a reminder, just place your questions in the chat as we go along here today. So Mike, it's all yours. Thanks, Scott. Good morning, everyone. Uh, if you're in the Midwest, I hope you got some rain, but not too much, <laughs> uh, not too much storm. So I saw it going across the uh, uh, Nebraska and Iowa this morning. So hopefully you got uh, some good moisture. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about um, who Pattern Ag is, what we do, how we do it, and then uh, how easy it is to connect your Climate Field View accounts to Pattern Ag. To, uh, to begin the journey of learning about what, what is happening in the biology of your fields. So I'm going to, so what we do is what's called predictive agronomy. Uh, it's different than anything that's ever occurred in agriculture before. So we take uh, biology and we look at very specific things such as pests, diseases, and desirables like trichoderma and mycorrhizal fungi and things like that. And we turn those insights around or back to you as the grower or to the grower so that you can make informed decisions on next year's soybean and corn crops. When you think about where agriculture's come from and where we're at today, uh, tremendous amounts of improvements have been made since my family founded uh, the farm in the late 1700s in Illinois, where you see the, uh, you know, the horse and the, um, um, plow and moving and, and then looking at the advances that we've made in both um, genetics as well as product uh, products that can be used to protect the crop. We've really advanced to the point where um, we've unlocked a, a great deal of potential. However, when you look at a bag of corn and a bag of soybeans, we have not unlocked even close to half the potential of that crop. When you look at a bag of soybeans, it's got 200 to 300 bushels of yield potential. Corn has four to 500 bushels of yield potential. And so the one thing that has been missing is a key link or the key linkage is understanding the biology of what you're putting that seed into, the very medium and understanding it. Because a, a seed is a co very complex uh, piece of genetics. And then the soil microbiome is far more complex than uh, even the human genome. And we unlocked a great deal in the human genome product. So what we're doing is we're mapping the soil microbiome and we're looking at the entire biology of that soil, looking for very specific things that are going to knock the uh, top end yield off. 
And so we consider this the next frontier in, uh, in agriculture, which is why I was so excited to join Danielle and the rest of the team two years ago. So when you, you know, this morning, there will probably be some growers that are, uh, you know, especially that had bad weather this uh, today, going out and looking at corn that may be down. Uh, this certainly happens every year or soybeans that may be exhibiting some sort of um, symptomology. You can't quite figure out what it was. And so oftentimes this gets blamed on the seed when it actually it's the pathogen in the soil that caused it when, they, when that pathogen expressed. So what we do is we look at the soil before planting so that you can prevent the things that, um, that you see occurring here on the right-hand side. We help you build a crop plan with, uh, with confidence. So the things that we inform in our reports, which I'm gonna do a product demonstration uh, shortly, are trait decisions. Do I need a corn rootworm trait or don't I? Um, do, do I need a hybrid that is resistant against Northern corn leaf blight or gray leaf spot or gossus wilt? Or do I need a seed treatment that's going to protect my soybeans against sudden death syndrome? So we look for the infections that are existing in those fields, the disease inoculum, and then we tell you and help you build a crop plan that you can be, that, so that you can have a greater deal of success. So it informs things like fungicide, insecticide, all the other things that you see on here, but not just that, but management practice such as scouting. You know, if I have an infected field of Northern corn leaf blight, I know specifically which field I need to go scout during season so that I can see if expression is occurring, get a timely fungicide application on it. So here are a, um, a list, I'm not gonna read all of these, but I'll highlight a few um, uh, very important things that we inform. So on corn, we're looking at things like corn rootworm, and we can not only tell you if it's, nor uh, we can not only tell you if it's there, how much is there, but we can show you if it's uh, northern, uh, if it's northern, or if it's uh, western, and that's going to inform management decisions such as rotation. Uh, we're looking at some of the most damaging seedling and root rots like Fusarium pythium. We're looking at diseases like anthracnose of corn. What you don't see on here for corn is the northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, and Goss's wilt, which are hugely impactful. When you just look at those three plus corn rootworm alone. That impacts about two and a half billion dollars of negative income for a, uh, for corn growers every year. We will be turning those on here in a few weeks. So um, anybody that is going to get a report for this fall, those pathogens will be included as well. In soybeans, we're looking at things like so, uh, soybean cyst nematode and sudden death syndrome. In our predict, uh, in our 2023 predictive ag report, we've got uh, Danielle's team did a really nice write up on sudden death syndrome because it's one of those pathogens that we know very little about uh, as, as compared to soybean cyst nematode and, and corn rootworm. So I encourage you to go online and order your uh, um, order of the uh, uh, predictive ag report, and then you can read that uh, write up. We look at biofertility, so we're going to be able to tell you. If you need um, if you need a nitrogen stabilizer, if you need a phosphorus solubilizing product, so you know there's a lot of places in Nebraska where Scott is where there's a lot of rock phosphorus under the ground, but the biological pathways don't exist to break that down. We can inform on which fields that you need to put a phosphorus solubilizing product, um, and then also things like your beneficials, your trichoderma species, your mycorrhizal fungi. So we're looking at the health of that soil. Do you have, uh, do you have the levels of, of trichoderma and mycorrhizal fungi that can make your soil even more productive so we can inform on pr uh, product decisions such as that? We also do, uh, we also do offer a malic test, which looks at all your macronutrients and micronutrients. And I'll show you how you can build a, uh, a fertilization plan in our product as well. So we can help you build an optimal crop plan for the next season on things that are hidden in the soil. You know, there's an old saying that farmers have 40 years to guess right. So we can take a lot of the guesswork out of building your crop plan and boost your profits by about, you know, on average, about $80 per acre just by making the right decision. 
do I need that corn rootworm trait? Do I need to make that extra spin or don't I? Where do I need to uh, make sure that I'm investing in a fungicide application or a seed treatment or do I not need that? So for the how we do it, I'm gonna turn it over to the smartest person on the screen, which is Dan Ms. Danielle Watts uh, to talk about uh, what we do and how we do it. Mike is being very humble, but thank you, Mike. Um, and so, you know, one of the core questions that we get is how are we really able to test for all of these? And then how do we make, turn those into uh, decisions that growers can make? Like, how do we determine that a field is at risk? Not just that the pathogen is present, which would be diagnostic, but really sort of predictive of the next year's risk levels. So just to start with, you know, we um, we do have a inherently geospatial data set. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that every soil sample we take is actually tagged to a part of the field. That way we can actually map these fields at a subfield level. Um, it's very similar to how chemistry is done, uh, where we have zones and we're able to sort of map our test to chemistry uh, testing. But that means that we're able to say this part of your field is at risk in these particular ways and this other part of your field is not, which really just allows growers a deeper level of insights. Then we take all of that soil and instead of just subsampling a small part of that soil to test, do you have nematodes? Do you have something in that soil? We actually put the entirety of that bag of soil that we collect into a blender where we're then extracting all of the DNA from that. So we're really sort of ensuring that, you know, we have, uh, you know, a, a really strong understanding of what is in every bag of soil that's shipped to our lab. That DNA extraction gives us a lot of details about the soil. We can, like as Mike was mentioning, we can really target specific species, we can target specific groups, and then we're able to build on that insight every year. For example, when we go to release our insights with the foliar pathogens, the, the corn pathogens that uh, Mike mentioned, the Gosses, Wilt, and whatnot, we'll actually be able to turn those insights on for every customer who has ever tested um, soil with that platform in our database. So all of our customers will be able to see it. And that way we're able to learn every year and really grow the insights for our growers. And then they're able to compare their fields, not just within the field, among fields, but then also across years. An evaluation of, is my soil improving? Is my pathogen load being reduced? Can I change my rotation structure because I've gotten certain pathogens under control? Yeah, and then how we are uh, sort of integrating that ourselves is really having a deep understanding of how do these relate to soil properties? How do these relate to the slope in your field? How does fertility interact with these? Uh, and, and there's sort of a host of insights that allows us to say not just that it's in your field, but that we know based on the conditions of your field, you are likely to be at risk for expression next year. Uh, next slide, Mike. Um, so taking that insight and translating that into a risk level does mean having a deeper understanding of how to benchmark a field. So, you know, one of the key things that I know every grower is aware of is that not all soils have the same risks, right? A sandy soil is gonna fundamentally have a different risk with nematodes than a wet soil is gonna have, you know, have for those same nematodes. So really sort of developing insights that allow you to say, based on fields that are comparable to mine, local to my field with the same, you know, climate and whatnot, what does risk actually mean? And so we do that a variety of ways. Um, some, in some cases, like sudden death syndrome, we've actually linked um, our test to the probability of expression of sudden death syndrome the next year. So there's a direct link to the risk. We can say if a field has a one in 20 risk of expression or a zone has a one in 20 risk of expression. And at a deeper level for some pathogens, we've gone several stages further. And I think corned rootworm is the perfect example of that. We developed an assay that is able to detect the number of eggs in a field. And then we linked that eggs in the field to the feeding damage done by those corned rootworm larvae the next year. And so we're not just saying, hey, you have eight eggs per unit of soil, which you know may or may not be meaningful, 
but able to say, we think that you're likely to have, uh, you know, one to two nodes worth of damage, which we know each node worth of damage, you get about a 15% hit to your yield with corn rootworm. So really being able to directly link to the um, yield that is at risk for growers with corn rootworm, um, really sort of like next levels, how a grower can manage for these pathogens in their fields. Uh, Mike? I'm going to uh, give it over to Mike for a product demonstration. Thanks, Danielle. And just to put a, a finer point on it, we take, Danielle's team takes extreme care towards sensitivity and specificity before we turn a pathogen on because we want to know if it's there, we need to understand that it's there and, by, and how much is there so that we can inform on those decisions. So it is not a trivial process to add a new pathogen. It takes quite some time to do that. And so um, you can feel assured that once we do turn it on, that it is there. And uh, another finer point that I wanted to make is we turn soil biology into gigabytes of data that go up into the cloud. And what that means is when we turn on a new pathogen, Danielle um, mentioned this, but when we turn it on, it turns it on for all past reports as well. So if you've been doing business with us for a couple of years, you can actually watch the biology of your soil change over time and the pathogen loads that change over time as well. Now I'll go into the product demonstration um, and show you actually what it looks like, or what the experience looks like. Okay. Seeing it, Scott? Looks okay. great, Mike. Okay, so this is, this is uh, and I'll level set everybody what you're looking at. So what you're looking at are, is an operation level. So this would be uh, a farm, uh, an operation, and what you're looking at over here would be fields. Okay, now this is a demo. These are actual fields, but we've anonymized them because we don't share customer data with anyone. We don't sell data. Um, so anything that you're looking at here has been anonymized, but these are actual fields uh, with actual results. Just to orient everyone, um, you're looking at, we can show you crop protection, biofertility, nutrition, cation, uh, cation ratios, and then you have the ability to write a script. So I'm going to go through uh, just a few of these where you can uh, gain your insights. So this is operation level view. Um, the legend is we use a stoplight view, which is red, yellow, green. If you're red, you're at high risk, yellow, moderate, green, low. But then we also show you, uh, um, you know, this, how much is there. So if it's there, how much is there? And so what we'll do is we'll just dive into one of these fields. So this field uh, in Champaign, um, this is the total pathogen load that exists on this field. And so you can see at a glance, boy, I'm gonna need on this particular field, I'm going to need uh, trait protection. And in some cases, I'm probably also going to, uh, I'm also going to need an uh, inferro insecticide. So let's just dive in on uh, corn rootworm here for a second. So at a, at a couple of clicks, you can really go in and learn a lot about these fields. So I wanna, I can see right here that 70% of my field is at risk for corn rootworm damage. The range is from zero to 26 eggs. And just to orient you, 26 eggs is extremely high. Uh, that is, that will overwhelm a trait, a stack trait. And so this is an area, this is probably a field that we would want to make an inferro insecticide application to supplement the corn rootworm uh, trait resistance as well. Um, and then you can see the ranges here. Our recommendations are general. We do not uh, specifically, um, you know, recommend, uh, we don't recommend specific products. We stay product agnostic, uh, but we provide a general set of recommendations to your trusted advisor so that they can recommend the right uh, trait package and the right hybrid for this field. Um, to dive in just a little bit deep, deeper on the details, you can go down here. And the numbers that you see, okay, so these are zones. And these are just random 10 acre uh, grids. So we sample on, on average at a 10, a 10 acre grid across the Midwest. If you're doing nutrients, you may wanna go two and a halves or fours, or uh, 4.4s or fives. Uh, typically it's two and a halves and we can do that. We can actually lay a, two, uh, a 10 acre grid over the two and a half acre grids 
uh, for the for the pathogen panels. What you're looking at here in terms of the numbers are the numbers of actual eggs in that zone. And this is very typical for what we see in a Midwestern field that has corn rootworm. It's really spotty. Um, and by testing this, by following the combine and testing these in the fall, we'll know sp with specificity where they're located and, and how you need to, uh, and what, uh, what protection that you, need to, um, that you need to take. So in this particular zone, we can see that we've got a high risk of 12 eggs. It's all Western corn rootworm. There's no corn, uh, Northern corn rootworm. Um, and your likely uh, ranges of root node injury are somewhere between 0 0.5 to 2.5. It, it all depends on expression. And the most, one of the common questions that we get is, do I need to test this every year uh, or can I test like once every four years? And the, my answer to that is corn rootworm moves around. The beetles have a choice on where they're going to lay their eggs in the fall. And so that changes every single year. There, and, and it cannot be predicted at a field level with traps alone. Traps will tell you where the beetles were flying around, but it doesn't tell you where they laid their eggs. Now, when we go back to uh, field level summary, um, there's a couple of others that are really interesting here too. I, um, the one that surprises people, uh, growers the most is sudden death syndrome. So when we click on that, and we go in to view the details, we are showing you the actual inoculum load that exists in this field. And then we give you the moderate risk. And then this is a field that you would obviously want to uh, put a seed uh, protection on there like uh, Salvo or uh, Olivo and uh, or Saltro and Olivo. So in this case, you would definitely want an Olivo treatment on there to protect, and you would also want to choose a soybean variety that will protect against it as well. Um, if you wanna make some comparisons, say, okay, which of my fields on my farm have these pathogen loads? You just simply click on this, and you can see that Champagne is, you know, it's, it's, in the high, it, it's in the high risk area, but the one in Indianapolis, uh, that field in particular is super high. And uh, so the pathogen loads are very high in that one as well. But you can just see that at a, you know, at a, uh, at a click level, you can go down there and see. We also provide analytic details. So why is SDS important? So we put, uh, you know, we talk about how it's, uh, how damaging it is for the crops and how it, uh, when it expresses what it looks like. So the data science team has done a really nice job of, uh, of putting those details in there. We go back to, uh, uh, back to the results. Uh, let's go over and look at biofertility. So on some of these fields, uh, let's just take a look at Des Moines, for example. Um, soybean nitrogen fixation that is at a high risk. So this is an area where we would say, you need to apply a rhizobia inoculant on this particular field because there is almost no um, nitrogen fixation that's going to be occurring on this field. For pea solubilization, for the most part, this field looks pretty good, but you've got a couple of areas here where the genetic pathways are not there to break down the rock phosphorus. As I said, we see quite frequently in Nebraska, this is a particular issue where there's plenty of phosphorus available, it's just not being broken down. Um, we also give you whether you need to apply, whether you should add plant growth promoters like trichoderma species to your field. So we're making biological product placements with these results. Uh, denitrification, do I need a nitrogen stabilizer on this field or not? And so, we inform not just crop protection decisions and, and uh, seed selection decisions, but all these biological products that are out there, we can help inform on product placement, which has always been kind of the Achilles heel of biological products. So now I'm gonna go back to, um, I'm gonna stop share, go back into the presentation. Happy to take questions at the end. Uh, let me go to back here. Okay. All right, so our process is pretty white glove. I mean, we do all the heavy lifting from scheduling, um, you know, samplers to come out and sample the fields to, uh, so that you don't have to do that, to getting those uh, samples shipped to us. But the process is really easy. You upload the fields from your Climate Field View account, which I'll show you in a second how to do that. 
and then place a sample plan with a click of a button. After uh, harvest, when you pull out of that field, or if you're a dealer, your customer pulls out of that field, you just go in and hit a button called marked ready. That is an indication and a signal to us to deploy samplers out to the field. Barring uh, unfavorable weather conditions, we like to have samplers out in the field within three to five days after that harvest uh, occurs. We target three days. And we have a whole, t we have uh, external teams of samplers that we send out and, and deploy in those areas. And then once those are, uh, once those samples are taken and shipped back to our facility within about two weeks, you're going to have your results that are, um, you know, mail, you know, mail us comes back, rootworm comes back faster. Uh, so they don't opt all, all uh, automatically populate at the same time. But typically within two weeks, you're going to have all of your results. And then you can use that to inform working with your C, uh, trusted advisor, whether that be an agronomist, whether that be a seed dealer, whether that be your retailer on specifically what seed you need to order for each of your fields and which ones for the next season need to be scouted for, you know, disease pathogens like northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, and Goss's will. Connecting to uh, connecting your CFV account, very simple. You just log into uh, Pattern Ag. Uh, once you become a customer of Pattern, a customer success manager will set up an account for you. Um, I want to pause there and just talk about this team, the customer success team, because it really separates us from uh, anything out there. Because, and when I talk about white glove service, you've got a human being that is agronomically experienced that will work with you on your accounts for any questions that you have, helping you upload your boundaries, um, your field boundaries, and then working with you. So you've always got a person that you can contact at Pattern Ag if you've got questions. Um, and then after the uh, customer success manager uh, connects, then you simply go in, you can upload your boundaries by click, uh, with a click of a button and just up, uh, upload those CSV files. And then we'll uh, be able to see your field. And then you can go in and um, place the orders for which fields you want to, uh, that you want to have tested. The simplest way, to, two ways to uh, upload field boundaries is, connect an outside account. So what we want to do is we want to upload uh, uh, shape files from your climate field view account. So we want to uh, connect that climate field view account with uh, two pattern eggs. So we have all these API connections already. It is the simplest way, literally takes seconds and a, a customer success manager would be there to help you uh, connect those, uh, connect your accounts. Then you just simply log into your account, complete the process by logging into your climate field view account. And then that's it. Um, you upload your boundaries, you place your, uh, which fields you wanna have sampled. And then um, we do the rest of the work. Once you tell us, hey, I'm, I'm done combining this field, hit a button, fields marked ready. We come out, we do all the work, we deliver the results to you. And then we're always there after the sale to uh to or after the service to make sure that if you have any questions we're there to answer them so you know there's so much that we don't know about our soil um you know every soil has a or every field has a story and the only thing that we can do today before what we before pattern was we knew the first chapter and we knew the last chapter the first chapter is here's what i planted here were the conditions the last chapter is Here's why yield results. There were so many things that happened during the season that we had no idea what was going on. And put simply, what we do is we fill in the chapters between one and the final chapter. But we do that in a predictive way to tell you, here is the story of what's going to happen on your field or what risks you face in the upcoming season. And here's what we recommend that you do to mitigate those risks and monitor and scout during the season. So then you have a more complete view of what happened in the story of that field. And I can tell you from a biological level, you can have two fields that are side by side that have a completely different fingerprint, completely different biologies. Um, and it's not unusual that we see that at all. So with that, we will stop Scott and uh, pause for questions. Yeah, that sounds great. No, thanks for the information and as well as the demo. I think it's awesome to see how simple it is just to connect the two accounts and make it as easy of a process as possible. So 
Uh, if you do have questions, make sure to keep those coming in through the chat. I do have quite a few here, Mike and Danielle. So maybe the first one is is a simple one. Uh, was the picture of the horse and the plow from your family farm at the very beginning? <laughs> no, we were too poor to afford a camera. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny answer. Uh, all right, so back to some some real questions here. Um, the first one, maybe Danielle, this is is a start for you, but a question around: Do I need to test every single year, or can I test every few years? How does biological testing vary from what I'm doing today with nutrient sampling for my grids or zones, for example? Yeah, that's a fantastic question, and I think extremely relevant. And the the real answer is: It depends on what you are managing for. There are certain pathogens where, like white mold or soybean cyst nematode, where unless you're watching a, a sort of downgrading of the abundance of it in your soil, you might be able to wait longer or only evaluate before planning on planting into soybean. But there are also a lot of pathogens that are highly variable year over year. And things like corn rootworm, we've actually watched fields year over year, watched their shift, and really have a deep understanding that like, you know, you can have dramatic shifts between low and high risk uh, year over year. Just and just it really depends on uh, you know, the climate that the um, corn rootworm uh, were, you know, becoming adults in, you know, did it hit the uh, population or did the population manage to expand? Uh, are they flying around? Did your neighbor plant a bunch of corn and now they're entering your field? So there's a lot of things that can change those. Um, there's also a lot of our um, analytics that are really linked to a lot of climate variables. So if you've had a wet year in year one, year two, you're likely to see a lot more of your, you know, seedling rots, your sudden death syndrome, you know, things that really can take off during a wet year, increase the inoculum load and increase your risk in year two. So things like that, uh, you know, we really do say if you have substantial challenges of those in your fields, it is worth checking year over year uh, because fundamentally, you know, it's going to shift. We do, however, provide a write-up uh, really detailing each one of our analytics and how much we observe it shift and what our general recommendations are. And then after that, I really, um, you know, encourage a, a grower to really sort of work with uh, whoever their sort of trusted advisor is in their field, their agronomist and whatnot, um, to sort of make those decisions of is this uh, something for year-over-year -year testing or not. In general, we do find most growers do observe high ROI of year-over-year -year sampling, but acknowledging that every field is a little bit unique and growers are responding to different, um, uh, you know, different needs. Excellent. That's a great question. Maybe this one, I'll kind of shuffle them around a little bit. This one fits into it, uh, maybe for both of you, but um, when I get a test and I start to understand some of the numbers, how does it better help me place different biological seeds, other crop inputs that I may have? Uh, yeah, Mike, do you want to take this one first from a sort of like ROI perspective? Yeah, so um, very specifically on picking products, we don't recommend actual product names. What we recommend are categories of products. So, for example, if you have high sudden death syndrome in your field, we're going to recommend that you put a seed treatment on there uh, to protect against it. Uh, likewise, when you look at the biological product placements, uh, we can tell you if you have very low levels of trichoderma species or mycorrhizal fungi which would then inform okay there are biological products out there that can add that health back into the soil and so that's where we make that general recommendation that to add those beneficials back into the soil there are a lot of soils out there that are just really deserts in terms of uh, biological health and you know that when we think about soil health, that's the way that we look at it. Is we look at it from a genetic level of the species that are really uh, proactive and helping that crop be as productive as possible. And so that's how we do that. We we just look at for those specific genetic species and then make a recommendation that you either do need a product or you don't need a product on there. Now with things like northern corn leaf blight, especially gosses wilt. Um, because there really isn't anything that you can do once you have it in the field. You really want to choose that hybrid that is going to be re best resistant against that particular pathogen. So what we're telling you is your field is infected. 
um, you need to protect by planting the right hybrid out there. But then for things like gray leaf spot and northern corn leaf blight, we can tell you specifically, hey, your agronomist needs to be, and the retail agronomist needs to be scouting these specific fields to look for expression instead of randomly driving around. You can throw a, a you can throw a drone up and and watch that field during the in season for a, a timely fungicide application. Anything you want to add, Danielle? Uh, no, I think you really covered it. You know, one of the things uh, in general that we're just um, very thoughtful about is there are a lot of products on the market. And those products can be quite regional. So we don't want to, you know, tell a grower that we think a particular product is the right one if it's not available or not appropriate for their soil. So we really try and, you know, provide a degree of insight that is agnostic to product so that people can really work with their uh, agronomist or seed retailer to sort of make those local decisions. Additionally, one last point is, yes, you do see numbers on, you know, because we provide you the specific inoculum loads, but what we really try to do is make it simple with just simple color coding. Uh, red is bad, and we're going to make a recommendation based on red is bad. Uh, we put the numbers in there so you can see how bad uh, the infections are in that, you know, in those fields. But they're not used there it's not there for the grower to make an informed decision we make we do that just simply by color coding things and making the recommendation at the field level so we're just to be clear when we make a recommendation is is for that field not for the sub zones because equipment doesn't really exist at scale today to to you know inform that kind of prescriptive um, um, application Oh, that's a great answer. I think of it in a way like an Apple Watch, right? It, it kind of gives me the pulse of what's going on. Then it's up to me to figure out what to do with it and, and how what what best suits me. So I think that's a really good example, being able to understand where we are today, but also where can we monitor in the future. Um, another question, maybe to build on top of this a little more even, do you have modeling for additional crops beyond soybeans and corn? And if not, do you have plans to expand to other additional crops in the future? Uh, Mike, you want me to take this one? Yeah, you can take that one. <laughs> uh, yeah, so great question. And I'm going to start with, we want to make sure when we're entering a crop system that we really understand not just the biology of the soil, but the agronomy of the crop and what how it is managed, what the, what the treatments level are, what the current state of research is, what the current state of you know, decision making for rotation or you know, seed selection is. So we are very thoughtful on how we enter new crops. And you know, as an example of that, I have a certified crop agronomist on my team to make sure we're extremely well informed. Now, uh, that gives some explanation on why we have really maintained ourselves in the corn and soybean uh, to date. Uh, we are um, going to be piloting at a small, smaller scale, at a very thoughtful scale, um, uh, some sugar beet. Uh, so we're really able to give some insights on the sugar beet rotation um, this fall uh, with an eye towards releasing at a larger scale later. And that's to really help growers and regions where they're doing a soybean um, sugar beet rotation. And then we have also been evaluating uh, cotton rotations uh, for the southern soils for that soybean cotton rotation. Um, and so uh, you can look forward to when we release those. We are, um, you know, hoping to really be able to expand into these spaces in 2024. But like I said, we're trying to do it very thoughtfully. Um, and we will certainly um, have like a public announcements when we're, we're fully ready to sort of expand in those regions. Excellent. Great answer. Um, a new question here, Mike, maybe this one's best suited for you. T to get a better idea, can you help give us an example of how one of your customers has used a test for either saving on inputs or increasing their yield? Just a, a good use case that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we've got a particular grower. I can use his name because he's he's given us permission to do that. We don't just uh, randomly uh, you know, <laughs> talk about our growers. Uh, but Paul Sittig, who is up in uh, southern Minnesota, South Dakota farms up there, and uh, last year he used our test, and the agronomists in the area were were telling him that, and, and the other growers, that there's no sudden death syndrome uh, in the area. Well, you couldn't see it because it was expressing below ground. It wasn't expressing above ground, and, you know, it's known as the silent yield robber. And so he ran tests on his fields last year. Um, he 
found that many of his fields were infected at high levels. Uh, so we were showing high levels of inoculum in those soils. And so he, what he did was he chose soybean varieties that were more tolerant or resistant to sudden death syndrome. And then also um, talk, uh, he also, uh, you know, used the high rate of uh, the seed treatment to protect against sudden death syndrome. And additionally, there were some other things that he had in there, seedling and root rot diseases. So he changed up his, uh, pack, his uh, fungicide package that he was putting out. And then also um, he had low boron levels. And so he did three applications of boron through the season. And so we got to the end of the season and our local rep, Eric, um, got a call from Paul, or maybe he called him, but anyway, they connected on the phone and uh, pa Paul was uh, pretty happy uh, to say the least about what was happening. And, and uh, so we asked, what, you know, what are your yields? Cause he was in the combine at the time and he was averaging 83 either 82 or 83. And uh, we asked him what his five-year historical, you know, yield average. And he said the best that he's ever done is 65. And he said, not only that, but my, my soybeans did not turn two, until two weeks after everybody else's in the area did. So obviously sudden death syndrome was expressing because it was all over the area. But since he was able to protect himself, he got another 20 bushels of soybeans out of there and was just thrilled at the results. We have a number of those, but that's one specific example that I can give of a grower um, that had, you know, that was able to take these insights, make decisions, simple decisions, but hugely impactful decisions on what he was going to do for the next year. That's awesome. Um, as a side note, I would tell you that uh, for the, any growers on here that are renting or looking to rent new ground, this is one hell of a due diligence tool to find out what kind of ground you're renting and what you can expect to uh, protect it because you're really kind of going in a dark room trying to guess right on uh, on the field that you're going to be, uh, the ground that you're going to be renting. That's a great example, Mike. And I think maybe this leads into another question. When you, we think about organisms and things under the ground, it's hard for us sometimes to, to picture and realize and really put it together into what makes a successful crop plan throughout the year, maybe more tongue in cheek, but how do we know what's actually there? Uh, how do we know what's what's in the ground and be able to extract and understand the variables and, and test and be able to make that decision? Yeah, that's a good one for Danielle. Yeah, <laughs> well, you know, so the there's a lot of, um, you know, varying ways in which scientists have tried to do this over the years. Certainly some are, you know, directly, you know, put something under the microscope and try and like, you know, decide is this little fungal bit, you know, one fungi versus another, um, or, you know, uh, trying to do uh, egg counts, uh, which are known to be like highly variable uh, in their outcomes. Uh, up to 300% is published by the ISE lab that I've looked at, um, or the PIDC lab. Uh, and then, you know, so, and, and then of course there's varying ways like um, PLFA testing and whatnot, um, but those don't necessarily give you those deeper details. And so by actually going straight to the DNA and taking all of the DNA, like this is the beauty of a metagenomic evaluation. We're slicing and dicing all of that DNA and then reading it and identifying it. And we do it in a few different ways. Like uh, candidly, uh, the infrastructure behind our DNA testing is uh, it's very exciting um, and you know very novel to what we are doing. Um, and, and allows us to do a lot of uh, deeper insights. But what that ultimately, like, like what uh, uh, a, you know, a grower is going to care about is that we're not just looking at one slice of the soil. We're characterizing all of that bacteria. When we say something about the diversity of that soil, it's not based on a like slimmed down world view, but it's really looking at the entirety of that profile and saying like, is this field highly diverse or not? Does this have a lot of trichoderma or not? And it allows us to go in a layer deeper on our identification. You know, I think rhizoctonia is a great example of that, right? Rhizoctonia root rot, nasty, you know, little fungus, you know, can cause some hidden damage that really can impact yield. Um, we're actually not just saying that you have this particular species, but that you have the specific subspecies that is known to be a pathogen in corn and soybean. 
And so it's, we're really specific. This is a problem for your crop in this way. It's not a, a generic test. Um, you know, it's, it's highly specific. Same thing with our fusariums. Um, you know, fusarium root rot, another like nasty, right, soil borne pathogen. There are fusarium in a average soil as a group of organisms should be uh, your most abundant fungi in the soil. It just, uh, that's the nature of it. Trichoderma, which is our plant growth promoters that you find in a lot of products, should be your second most abundant. That's just everywhere. Looking across the U.S., you should see those two at really high abundance. What is interesting, though, is which are the organisms that are actually making up that community? Are they in balance? Are they, um, you know, skewing towards your fungal groups and not just your like common sort of decomposers hanging out in the soil doing, you know, happy soil things. Um, and so by being so, by looking at the DNA, we're really able to say it is this species. This species is a pathogen. You know, we're really being targeted in a deeper level. Excellent. And maybe just a little more on that one. Once we understand what's in the soil, how do you choose which types of analytics for different pests and pathogens that you offer? How do you find that sweet spot and ultimately make that easy recommendation to the to the user? Yeah, uh, that is also a great question. I mean, at its core, right? We are we're not interested in just giving an insight for insight's sake, right? This needs to be an insight where you can make a decision on it, right? There's an active management decision I can make on this, and it needs to be relevant. It's not helpful to know if there is, you know, a random organism in your field that, you know, may or may not ever impact your corn or soybean plant. Um, you know, so uh, what we're always looking at is the scale of the yield hit that having it or not in your field has. What is the cost of the management of that treatment? You know, like if it is in extremely cheap management and people are going to do it, you know, universally, it's not helpful to have a test on it. It's not meaningfully changing management. It's not meaningfully helping them make decisions about products or seed traits you know, uh, placement. Um, and so we really are focusing on yield and management and ultimately what is the sort of like financial underpinning to this, uh, this pathogen or this beneficial organism? Does it really change the growers, you know, uh, you know, economics by knowing more about it? Very good. A um, couple other questions here. One that came in was, can you comment a little bit on soil organic carbon inventory and flux and maybe for use in other partners? Uh, one that they mentioned was foreground, one that we'll have this afternoon. Uh, but can you talk a little bit about soil organic carbon and, and regenerative ag as a whole, maybe? Yeah, OK, so I'll, I'll speak first to uh, soil organic carbon and then um, to regenerative ag, because I think they're slightly different. They're, they're, there's a lot of overlap between those, but there is a little bit of specificity. Um, so soil organic carbon, um, you know, it, we are not necessarily a chemistry company. We do chemistry testing. We do that to help our grower sort of link uh, their, their biology to their chemistry. Um, but those deeper questions of like the exact uh, molecule of, of carbon that's in the soil, um, we really give an OM, so organic matter evaluation, um, but we're not doing some of those uh, more specific uh, chemistry tests. Now we are looking at developing some of those. So um, in a year, uh, you know, I'm, we might have a different answer. Uh -huh. But currently, state of the state of the company, we're not um, providing a sort of SOC specific test. That said, uh, we are doing a lot of the evaluations of the genetic makeup of carbon metabolism. So getting into the sort of like geeky science side, which of course, it's going to be something I love doing, but we are doing a lot of deeper evaluations of the relationship um, between the metabolism of the communities um, and the genetic makeup of those and carbon, but we don't have anything currently on market uh, related to that. Now, getting into the regenerative ag question, though, this is something where there are a lot of details that are related between the biology of the soil and regenerative ag practices. And so I'm going to refer back to our predictive ag report from last year that Mike referenced. Uh, we actually have a whole section on regenerative ag and some evaluations that we did of really understanding, um, particularly in this case, we focused on tilling. Um, and regenerative ag around tilling practices and sort of uh, its impact. 
Um, and we're able to, to sort of really understand, not just like if you're doing a field to field comparison, what do you observe? But if you're looking at lots of different types of soils and lots of different types of fields, what is the relationship between the biology of your soil and that management practice? Um, you know, and certainly found there's like really interesting dynamic relationships between pathogens and tilling. Um, obviously, you know, one of the reasons why some growers till is to bury that pathogen and try and manage that pathogen. So that's something very useful for a grower to understand as I'm making different um, tilling decisions. What is my pathogen risk associated with that? Um, but we also really sort of uncovered some interesting dynamics between are you in a drier soil condition or a wetter soil condition? And so when you're looking more holistically at, um, you know, the, that field condition of, you know, is, is this regenerative practice um, really benefiting my soil? In some cases, we find it's a lot more complicated than the very simple narratives we have around regenerative ag. And our goal is to make it easier for growers uh, to say, this practice is going to net me a lot of good outcomes. This practice, um, I might need to be a little bit more thoughtful about how I incorporate it. Um, so, you know, I think tilling is a great case. If you have, you know, high pathogen loads in a soil that you need to worry about, you know, you might choose a different management um, style. You're not going to just stop tilling. You might need to treat your fields or choose different um, uh, genetic stocks to be able to handle that increased pathogen risk. That's my rather complicated answer on that side. Um, but we really are focusing on how do we help growers make decisions on which regenerative ag they can easily incorporate into their practice. No, I think that was good. And I, I think trying to understand the balance and the differences between how all these interactions happen in the soil, right, is ultimately what's going to affect that crop potential and, and how it moves forward. So maybe one to, to touch on some of the future 10 years from now, what does the future of testing look like? What we see differences in soil sensing and imagery, automation of samples. What do you think is going to be the, the future of soil testing, driving more confidence for farmers, just maybe more futuristic than anything? You know, I I think Mike and I are going to have um, a lot of answers to that in common and some that might diverge just from our different standpoints. But I think one of the big ones is we're, we're seeing a shift towards increased automation, increased use of robotics, increased use of, you know, precision ag, you know, equipment and tooling and a higher degree of, um, you know, uh, sort of how to say, stacking of these insights. We're seeing it on a digital space. We're also practicing that ourselves by, you know, uh, candidly on ours, we actually use satellite data and machine data and soils data. Like that's how we drive our insights and make sure that we are able to provide insights. And I think our industry as a whole is shifting increasingly towards integrative insights, um, automation, uh, you know, machine robotics and whatnot. Uh, uh, Mike, you wanna? You want to pick up yeah, I think I'll, I'll just dovetail on what Danielle said, um, you know, that the technology exists today, but the big unlock is what's happening in the soil to inform where and how to use that machinery, right? So by, we can give a subfield view of what's happening across that entire operation, but the equipment really, you know, is is somewhat limited. There is uh, there is machinery out there today that you can use that to do predict uh, prescriptive um, uh, planting, prescriptive uh, treatments, um, you know, for fungicides and things like that. So we believe that this is the true unlock of mapping the soil microbiome and understanding fundamentally what is happening in that very medium that you're placing that seed but doing it in a predictive way. So we believe that what we're doing is going to unlock even more technology because it is the major missing piece of data. And when we link that to climate, which you know Danielle has experience in that, when we link it to climate, we cannot just predict what's there, but what's going to express and how, and, ha and, and change the behaviors on how to manage those crops in season. So I'm excited about the future. 10 years from now, who knows? I mean, the change is happening so fast. Ask me about two years, but what we're unlocking is going to create a flywheel effect of change within production agriculture. And you know, I'll make a point because the question was asked, well, what, you know, when will you be going into other crops? We specifically focused on corn and so soybeans because we want to fundamentally change 
the most important part of agriculture, which is mass crop production of corn and soybeans, because it unlocks the caloric output uh, that we need to feed a world. We're not going to get more land, so we've got to be more productive on the land that we are, which is why I'm excited about this, because once you fundamentally change mass corn and soybean production, both, you know, it, not only in North America, but the rest of the world, it's a big unlock. And it allows us then to rapidly expand into other crops that, you know, cross over or overlap with corn and soybeans. No, those are those are great answers. I think it's it's funny. I my grandpa ranched his whole life. And if I'd have asked him every decade, he was born in the 20s. But if I'd asked him at 20, 30, 40, 50, what's the next 10 years? I don't think he would have had <laughs> the right right direction of everything that changed just in his short amount of time. So being able to see how things are, are moving and shifting and getting more to that confidence and the right decision to make on a farm, I think is is huge. So um, last question that we have here and the, the big question, Mike, I think this one's for you is what's the cost? What's the cost of Pattern Ag Services and, and how do I get started? Yeah, so we've, we've really got three products, which is, you know, the first one is a pressure panel. Uh, which tells you corn, rootworm, soybean cyst nematode, sudden death syndrome, gives you those big pathogens there. And that's a cost of about a bushel of corn. Um, we don't set the cost to the grower. We work through a dealer network. So the dealer sets the cost, but it's about a bushel of corn is what that costs. Uh, for the entire 360 package, which is all biology, which which is what I went through on the, on the call, plus a Malik 3 test, um, you know, that will give you all your micros and macros, that's about the cost of a bushel of soybeans. So for the cost of a bushel of soybeans, you can unlock uh, and understand all of your pathogens that exist in your crop that are going to be, the, that are going to have the greatest impact that can help you make decisions. So for a bushel, of, a so, cost of a bushel of soybeans, and in Paul Sittig's case, his return on investment was another 20 bushels that he was able to put into the, into the bin at the end of the season. Excellent. Well, I think those are all the questions we have. I see we've got about five minutes, so perfect timing here for folks to grab a, a quick break before we jump into the main session. So thanks again uh, for joining us here today on the Pattern Ag session. Mike, Danielle, this was awesome information. I think it, it really helped me even understand a little bit more about how we can connect together and drive some of the value for customers. So 